Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the regularly scheduled the meeting school for the Board of Education for the School District of North Carolina to order. With a roll call vote, please. Chisholm. Here. Pack. Here. Streeter. Lapsky here. Will. Here. Report on public notice, Mr. Sam. Excuse me, sorry. I got a little not this chip there in my mouth. Uh, public notices were posted at the school district offices, the U.S. Bank, and the village municipal buildings um, on December 16, 2016. They were also ma mailed to the uh, KFIC 107.1, the Bull, um, the Reporter, and also Sunny 97.7 News, also on December 16, 2016. Thank you, Mr. Sato. Please rise as we always do for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Minutes were distributed to the board members in the packet. Does anyone have any additional comments or corrections? Questions uh, in relation to the minutes of our last meeting. If not, they'll stand approved then as distributed. Uh, the treasurer's report is next on the agenda. I can, Mr. Shear, if it's a pleasure that, that the board, I can do that, please. Um, treasurer's report, cash balance on hand as of. Uh, November 28, 2016, uh, we were at a deficit of 84, just uh, under 85 thousand um, dollars. Receipts for the month, up to now, were 43,459.40, um, and we transferred 1.5 million dollars from our investment accounts to make sure we could pay our bills. Uh, total receipts were 1.458, uh, 494 million dollars and 69 cents. Um, this uh, month, from 11:29 to 12:19. The district had expenditures of one million two hundred seventy-five thousand two hundred forty-four dollars and twenty-four cents for total expenditures of that same number. Um, thus, cash balance on hand at this time is one hundred eighty-three thousand two hundred fifty dollars and forty-five cents. Um, I will now uh, present to the board uh, a recommendation to pay the bills of the attached list um, from December nineteenth, two thousand sixteen, in the amount of nine hundred twelve thousand one hundred five dollars and thirty-nine cents. Mr. Sidoff, any of the members of the board have any questions about the uh, amounts that were presented for approval? If not, what's the pleasure of the board for the uh, checks for the uh, bills that have been presented? I'll make a motion. I'll second that. Roll call, please. Yes. Chisholm? Yes. Streeter, Lobatsky, yes. Yes. All right, motion carries, thank you. Those are approved. Next on the agenda is the clerk's report. There are a few donations <coughs> I will pass. Can I summarize them all? Actually? Yes. So, society insurance, $200 matching. Um, Ken Stefani um, is part of that. He gets he donated. I believe reports um, an instrument that the society has a program to match what they do. Robert Easy, $50 as a thank you for the BAMS Veterans Day celebration. Michael and Vicki Joka, $100 for the scholarship fund. Fond du Lac Association of Commerce, $50 for art supplies for bowls. Diane Gilliam, $4,210 scholarship for students going on to technical college. Service League of Fund $200 for ELC Compassion Fund and Child Development Days. And we'll have some more. I think we just received some more money from the Service League, who just does an excellent job supporting our students in the most. Thank you. So I'll put those on January. Also, what I want to mention too with donations on friendship under the leadership of Terry Gravy and a bunch of other elves over there. 
are how many families right now, Carrie Joe? I have to apologize because I thought it was families. It's Pete, it's children, so it's over 100 family members. Excellent. Comprising a variety of families. Excellent. And we will, since it's running, it's a little earlier, I will have that list of the thank yous. Um, that will be completed and gotten out to everybody, and we'll have that for uh, our donations report in January. Yep, Terry's working on the right now. Cool. And I took pictures of anybody, which I can send your way. Uh, I have a question about one of the donations. Mm -hmm. um, the scholarship that uh, Diane gave, I'm assuming in Mark's name, uh, mm -hmm. is is that going to be is that a name scholarship? Is it a uh, continuing? Uh, and were there conditions set up? I was just curious if it's. Um, they will. I believe it's seven hundred and fifty. Maybe you know Samantha, but I thought it was seven hundred and fifty per year. They just donated the entire amount at one time. And it is a Okay. I think it's through, being run through. <coughs> it's run through the district. The, so, course, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can so remember. I know Jill emailed, have, but I, I have to look at specific. Is this one that's put on that common? application and if they so what the district has done under leadership of Jenny Stahl and uh, Jill Gable is there's a uh, one application for the Oriole place or the <coughs> scholarships the boredom in the Kellogg this one Aramark has one um, there's I think like maybe even a few more but students apply one time and depending on what they check for what they qualify for then they're entered for all these scholarships and if I remember correctly again I'll, I'll see if I can pull up my email from her the family wanted to select to be perfect Winner, um, not our panel. Like the step back. Mm -hmm. So, the show, so she'll be involved in the selection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or questions for the person? Right. I just really quick the geezy one, pretty fun. Mike, why don't you just start? Adam, I think maybe, were you the one who received this or was it you, Mike? Uh, yeah, I had. Um, this gentleman had just come into the district office towards him. It's been the first person he saw and just asked, he said hi, and asked if he needed any help. And he just handed this uh, letter that he wrote as a thank you to the student that wrote him and gave him a $50 check. And he was just really moved by this letter that he received from one of our middle school students. And, um, and he said, yeah, it just made a huge, it was a huge deal for him. And he said, I normally don't just give money, but I just really, it's really meant a lot to me. And thank you so much. So then I, Pass on to Mike and Mike talk to the student and share that with, with him, I believe. Yeah, one of my favorite parts of, of my job the last couple of weeks has been calling students down and showing them the response that the veterans have given to our school. It's on Facebook, it's on uh, phone calls. We have over 40 phone calls from the veterans. <coughs> they work with the American Legion and uh, we 490 letters were written to local veterans. Just a simple template, thank you for your service. And there are a lot of individuals that have never received a letter like that. They were very moved by that. So it was definitely a highlight for us and a great teachable moment for our students, too. And Teresa Galligan Abbotson was one of the main leaders yes. of that, our eighth grade social studies teacher. And she was the main person that organized everything. Somebody shared that on that. Positively found a lot of people. You were tagged in it actually. <coughs> so he just said, That just really made my day. I've never, and then all of these veterans were like, I got one too, I got one too, I got one too. And it was just really good. Awesome. All right, next on the agenda, student council report. Ms. Seda. Um, so, not too much, just like ending up the conversation with Mark about second semester. Um, but we did have a choral concert last Wednesday and a band concert along with the person. How did work out? Um, because you were able to help three. Or, you don't help, you help the children, like a different child. Um, I know we raised over 300 dollars, but I'm not sure on how many kids we raised. Did you want to share about shopping? Sure. Well, I went along <laughs> shopping this year. Um, a few of the student council members, like, volunteer to go and we go with our advisor so it's going to sense and we're given a certain amount for each student and then we're giving we're given um, like a description of what their parent said would be like be fit for that child and we just have to go this time and respond. 
What class one did you have? Any more? Five Jews. So they get a movie. Thursday. Oh, move. I was prompting. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> there you know, was one. Right. Right. And you're watching <laughs> what movie? Uh, well, okay. watch out for those yellow ones. They don't stop. Uh -huh. You had mentioned something about a secret Santa thing, too, if it's still come. What's that? Um, so this year, uh, a few of like, the student council officers wanted to like spread the holiday cheer, so we decided to do a secret Santa. So that's between us and the teacher. Um, our secretary, Marissa Strobel, she sent out a survey to all the staff in the high school asking if they'd like to participate. If they didn't, then we wouldn't like put their name with a, with a member. So I'll just use mine, for example. So I have Mr. Dieter. Shh, a video. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Let's hope he doesn't watch. Add it, add it, add it. <laughs> so it. So I have Mr. Dieter. Well, I have a teacher. <laughs> and so every day I can like give him a card, give him just a little something, just to like keep that holiday spirit going. And then on Thursday I'll reveal myself. But I really <laughs> should trade with someone. Your, yeah, your secret's safe amongst us. <laughs> we won't tell him. All right, bring it up. All right, next at seven. Uh, 16, I will open the meeting up for citizens' input. Are there any citizens present that wish to be heard at this time? Hearing and seeing none, I will declare the citizens' portion of the meeting close at 7 17. Item number J, Superintendent's Report. Thank you. Get away, Mr. Sato. Thank you, President Chisholm. Uh, pretty light uh, tonight. Uh, uh, updated facility committee process of ref referendum question formation all of you were at that meeting along with Mary and Dave and I think we had quite a few administrators exciting we're moving forward with a referendum in April now it's just a matter of getting that design and initial price one of the key things right now is just as we went out to get information about our facilities and we went out to survey now we're going out to referendum which means we are not designing the end product we're getting an idea getting a cost estimate so that we can get a referendum question and when or if and when the referendum does pass be it one or two questions um, then that next process of designing implementation and building will happen um, the next steps right now are i will be meeting with uh clint uh from bray tomorrow uh at 4 30 i think carrie joe will be there too uh and we're just going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas and that enduring ideas from our goals that we talked about like for instance we know it's going to be a larger school 700 students but how can we keep that small school feel how can we have flex flexible workspaces how can we have areas for um, uh, to do differentiated instruction but still maintain the integrity of, of the quietness how can we separate those early childhood through 4k um, from maybe the older children uh, how can we uh, utilize our spaces to meet all the needs uh, for specialties and for encores so there's a lot of different questions that we have, but we're going to get an idea, get a uh, really good answer, and then I believe it's Wednesday the 10th of January, if I'm correct on that. The group will get back together, and that's when we're going to have a plan. Um, and also Bray will be working with some of its partners, including C.D. Smith and Marion, just to get some ideas of cost. Um, not that we're going to be going with any of those groups per se, but just get an idea of, of cost. Then we'll finalize that question. If we need to meet again, we will. And the idea is that at the board, in our next board meeting, one of the uh, items will be to adopt a resolution to have a referendum question on the April ballot, which then at that time will start a whole bunch of more uh, movement. So at that time, I'll open up the floor to anybody, which is pretty much everybody here, if they have any other input on that meeting. What they thought. Well, I guess one thing, just we still have to get to the point of what things we're going to ask about you know, French, the building. French building is a huge piece of the puzzle, but there were other things in the survey that had numbers that maybe not you know, weren't the greatest as far as acceptance as I regret it that we talked about. So we'll have to decide if we're going to try to do some of that or just put it on the capital plan for future you know, things like that. So. What we're going to be doing with Bray is working on that early childhood, the friendship thing, what, or ELC. Do we tear the whole thing down, kind of? we got some ideas and there's going to be some options to kick around. And if money is saved there, then that money would need to be invested maybe at friendship to do something there. Um, and then what we're also going to do is talking with 
the group and also knowing the needs of the buildings, talking with administrators and teachers, what are the two to three million dollar questions that the community said that they would support at Bessie Allen and Horace Mansell. We'll definitely be on that tomorrow. I think we'll have a better idea. I'll be working with Bray. Um, we got each other's numbers. I'm sure we're going to talk numerous times over the holidays and uh, have a really good plan on the 10th to really digest. Now, if we get information back sooner, I'll definitely share it with everybody. Um, understanding, once again, this process. We're not going to final build. We're just going to get uh, very good ideas so we know what types of resources to ask our community to accelerate our building plan. Is it Tuesday, January? I think it's Wednesday. <coughs> January 10th is a Tuesday. Is it a Monday? Here, I've got it on my thing. I know I put it in. You mean there was a Monday the 9th? Oh, wait, you went with the 11th? It's the 11th at 6.30, the Wednesday. Wednesday the 11th Wednesday at 6.30. 6 30. Good thing I asked. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> and we also set and the, the 16th. 16th. Yeah. So we have two dates already set. The 11th and the 16th. They're both at 6.30. And if we don't need to, we won't use to, but if we do, we do. So, Excellent. All right, personnel update. Just really quick, I thought I'd just throw out a big thanks to uh, uh, Jane Weinberg. She's going to be resigning. Um, she did, uh, and as I mentioned, she did a lot at our high school. She worked at ALC for a while, but now she's been full-time at the high school with uh, instructional aid with our special education department. Got an opportunity to invest in some uh, student driving up in Appleton, so that should be exciting. So we thank her, her last day. Just to give you a little bit of context, her daughter's Ramsey Himmel. So it's been nice to have the, the Weinbergs or that family together. So she's very thankful, leaving just for a different opportunity. Um, and, we're, and then also Ms. Friedel over at uh, FLC resigned so we wish her well we're looking for somebody to fill that position now also um, just saw uh, Jeff Strats he's all jacked up ready to go came and got his card and everything today uh, so we will have him back um, and then as far as other personnel at this time I haven't gotten any official retirements yet um, I'm hoping I think there are a few uh, and I'm hoping that the staff will give us those names so we can start to look we know that educators are at a premium and we want to make sure that we can be on top of it. There is a education fair. I haven't talked to the administrative team about this yet, but CESA 6 is going to start its first ever uh, educator or employment fair, and I would like to get a booth there, bring Owen along, really sell our district because I know we're going to continually always need needs. So, um, got a lot of fun stuff ahead of us. Um, a lot of our new staff has been doing very well. Uh, what I'll ask administrators really quickly is just mention one of your staff members, just one, not all of them, one that's new to the district, and tell us a little bit about what they're doing great. Yes, sir. You bet. Um, we have a new fourth grade teacher, Lauren Violo. Um, she came from Higher Elementary in Fond du Lac, and we are so fortunate to have her. She does amazing things. She teaches fourth grade literacy and social studies, and just absolutely an amazing top notch teacher. Excellent. Mike? Uh, Patrick Flanagan, he is a sixth grade math and science <coughs> teacher, just phenomenal. Comes with a lot of experience from Oshkosh. Just the, the kids have really latched on to him so quickly. And I'm very impressed with his poise and his willingness to contribute in so many ways outside of school. Chris, Kristen Eide, and she comes to us from Illinois. Yes, yeah, she's a bear fan, and I hired her. That's too bad. <laughs> Sorry, that isn't the reason. No, she does really amazing things pushing into our 4K classes, both over here at Divine Savior. You've probably seen her over there a number of times. Um, and with Head Start and stuff, and had some tough kids, and has done a really, really nice job with the um, Arts for Kids, the two sections there, and with Head Start with the 4K special ed group. Excellent. Samantha? I like all my people. Um, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll just say for this meeting, uh, Krista Klonderman. Um, so English, I think, you know, high school can, can be a um, not always well-received subject. Um, Chris is co-teaching with Jana Weekend, and they have really made, um, they're, they're trying everything. They're throwing different things with the kids. Eighth hour, they have a reward system. They had some issues with cell phones. They developed something that, like a pilot in their room for cell phones. Um, they're, they're just really working to find the best um, model together. Um, Krista did a fantastic job with the musical as well, and she's just, you know, um, trying new things. Um, we originally had on our schedule um, a group of nine students for AP Language second semester, and um, 
she wasn't sure about that fit and after looking at students and different options um, we have it in our course description booklet for next year next year we're going to do kind of a pilot this spring of really offering the MPTC English um, credit so that it's a dual enrollment course that kids do not have to pay for and if they go on to technical college it meets their requirement and then in addition to that if you're a four-year college student it'll, it'll transfer as an elective so just you know, really proud of her of the chances and the risks that she's taken so far. So. Dave, do you have anybody know? I'm to think. Well, I've got Sue, but uh, she's she's fallen into place very right well, and uh, all our staff is you know we've been kind of short circuited all year with one person or another, but they've all been doing a great job of filling in whatever it's needed to be get done. So and Dave's got a great crew where if there's somebody out, which normally there seems to be, that <laughs> <laughs> been, I mean even though there's overtime, I can tell you that's a lot to ask of our staff. And they're more than it's the most positive group of custodians and maintenance people and you can probably ask mary that i it's been 11 years and i've been here 11 years and i can't remember a better group of i mean not that other groups are good but this is it seems like we're clicking pretty good mm -hmm. adam yeah, i was just going to add um just with our new staff i've set up meetings with them and met with some of them already just to ask them about their transition to the district and um you know what um how they think our mentoring program is what you know, we could do differently to get better for future um, uh, teachers or administrators that come to the district, and then um, I'll share that once we get through those with the admin team. We'll see if there's any any changes we think we want to make. But it's been some nice feedback we've gotten so far. What's one person? Um, well, I met with Lauren. She was really excited and just really feels good about the transition. Feels that her needs are being met and just really feels good about the the vision of the district and that and the choice she made to come here was a good one. So. We want to keep that going and I think a lot of people just appreciate having being asked the question and being asked hey are you feeling supported are you feeling that you know the tra transition has been positive so I think people really appreciate that I never was asked that before in any other district so all right now I'll mention uh, two Mike Gonzalez and uh, Carrie Jill Patton. Pick one, one. one. You know what? Hey, last time I checked, I could do. I, I'm going to take some liberty here and change the rules for myself. What I'm going to say is that um, these two individuals, and I, I, I'm going to speak for all that. They've made us better. They know what they're doing. They're competent. They uh, are hardworking. They're compassionate. Um, they don't have an ego, uh, and they fit in very good. I think they complement us. I think they're uh, very. They have skills maybe that we don't have. Uh, but the skills that they have that I admire most are their dedication, their hard work, their honesty, um, and uh, their knowledge. So I'm very impressed. Uh, those two are making me, along with the rest of the administrative team, look very good. So thanks for being uh, taking a chance interviewing here. Then also I'm going to also mention that Adam. Pretty excited to see what he's going to do in order to help us move forward. He's into a role, and as you can see, keep asking what he's doing. He's doing some amazing things, and it's all going to get flushed out with student achievement and growth. So I'm very impressed with the administrators we had before, but also Adam in your new position, and then Carrie, Joe, and Mike, thank you for being part of Oriole Nation. Thanks for having us. It's a great team. All right, All right policy update. Uh, the good Dr. Richard Zimmon uh, came last week. We are about three behind, uh, but I've organized everything. He's going to do some inputting. I'll probably have about 70 to 100 different policies. Most of them will just be based off of uh, federal laws, state laws that had to be changed, uh, and they're changing the way that they update policy, so it's going to be a lot more streamlined. So that'll be happening, and that's more of a legacy thing for all of us. We have, I, I can't, I've never had a staff member that before we had them online ask, where's a policy for this, this, and this? Because you can go right on, search for animals, search for whatever you want, and it's all right there. So I think this is, uh, we've done a really great thing for the legacy of our district, and we'll keep that updated. So look for that in uh, March, April, May. Um, one other thing, uh, I will possibly be bringing um, a future board item, uh, activity count for the Friendship PTO. I just want to throw that out there. We're looking at our relationships with the district with all of our different groups. Oil Nation has really kind of encumbered a lot, and there's been a lot of uh, misunderstandings and ideas of what Oil Nation is and isn't. And all Oriole Nation is is a fundraising 501c3 that supports every group that wants to be part of it. Um, so Friendship right now with their leadership is in a crossroads. I'm going to have a meeting with them on Wednesday. And we're just looking what bylaws you have. Uh, just finding out if there are some. Are they still a 501c3? If they are, district supporting in any way they can that we can to help support them. If not, we'll have some options. 
for them to look forward to uh, maintaining and just reorganizing. But I just want to give you a heads up because there could be some more conversations out there um, about Friendship PTO, but I can tell you 100% the district is looking just to make sure that our relationship, even with the Touchdown Club, which has done a great job, we, they have bylaws, anytime they ask for anything, transparency is all there. Oriole Nation, I believe, has been doing a good job. We just, our name associated with uh, different groups has to be protected. And we're just moving forward to make sure we can do the best thing. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, I don't know how it's all going to pan out, but I'm pretty excited to make sure that we can do anything to support Friendship PTO. So that might be coming up. One of the main things that our practices have been is that when the district officially recognizes another entity, they create an activity account that I recommend to the board and the board then approves, which means then that money is part of the audit. So it's one of the cleanest way to make sure that when we look at activity accounts and money, that there's a process that the group then can decide how to access that money is set up. So if that's the way that the Friendship PTO wants to go, uh, that could possibly be something that's going to be coming soon. So that's the only other thing that I have on future board agenda items. Um, and the last thing I'll say is look forward to going down to the board convention look for an update and kind of an idea and itinerary. I think we got everybody but Mike that's going to participate at least for one day, if not two. I will be leaving early Friday morning because we have an in-service that day, so I'll be coming back to support that. But Maria and the crew, you guys all will stay, and hopefully we're going to be, Dave, you're going to be a busy guy walking through that uh, big uh, showcase area and talking to different vendors and builders and things like that. So we should have a lot of fun. Yep. So uh, any other things that you guys can think of, future board coming up? Uh, hand or uh, the your Samantha's has a preliminary course description book uh, completed. Um, they're going to distribute it possibly before our next board meeting. I said that wouldn't be an issue if there's anything that we want to change. Registration isn't happening until then, uh, and I didn't want to rush it in. They just got that to me last week, like Thursday or Friday. Um, so pretty excited about the course description book that's including some new things and you know reordering some things. So pretty excited. So. Look for those things coming up and a lot of referendum talk. And at this time, uh, if you have any questions, you'll notice the administrative reports are just adding on where they are with their goals and then other dates that are coming up. Okay. Any questions? Hearing none, item K, new business. Number one, discuss and consider moving March board meeting to Monday, March 20th. <coughs> so this is for spring break and... Yep, I'll be in Florida. Now, <laughs> I don't, uh, and we'll be on spring break. Now, I do have utmost confidence that if I get everything together, um, the student council representative, I think, will not be in town either. <laughs> um, so I'm sure that the administrative team would probably make it a priority to come back on that Monday of spring break if it was a pleasure of the board. I would recommend possibly looking at changing from the 27th to the 20th um, just because of that. We did that last year also and uh, by convenience many of you that do have children in the district will be gone so I would I would ask to have a conversation and consider doing that. As much as I know we want to always keep the fourth Monday except for, I know Christmas we've had some things and then at this time, and we also do add a second week in May so we can do contracts, that's become something that we do. Um, I would ask the board to consider this. Don't say any problem with it. Go. We need you there, basically. Um, I mean, we can do it, but... Well, I could Skype in, FaceTime. <laughs> it just makes more sense. You know, and I agree, that I've been pushed that in the past where we can need to be consistent, but you know, they're, they're knocking down the doors to get in here for a meeting. So if we move it a week for a very good reason, that's fine. And one thing is this is March, we're in December, so it's plenty of time. We'll get it out there if somebody has. And we're gonna we're gonna advertise the heck out of our board meetings because this will be the one before the April election. Um, so it'll be pretty exciting. I mean we'll there's there's no reason anybody won't know what's going on because we'll be very transparent and out and vocal and out and about for sure. All right, so I'll lay that out to the board. What's the pleasure of the board? Do we a motion? I'll make the motion. Change the March meeting to March 20th, 2017. All right. Any further discussion? No, we'll call it, please. Huck? Yes. No. Yes. Chisholm? Yes. Yes. 
Motion passed. The 20th it is. Next on the agenda is discuss and consider contract with the Horton Group for Benefits and Insurance Consulting. All right, I will share this with uh, a business manager, Maria Putzer. Um, we used to have a group called Key Benefits. Uh, Key Benefits is growing and they're having some different um, needs. So this past year we were teamed up with Horton Group, which they kind of subletted us out to for this. Um, and I'll, I'll, what I did is I passed out here, it's a $24,000 contract. Um, it's something that we budgeted and we can't afford. And matter of fact, I think it's one of those things that if we didn't have, now that we understand what we can get and how they work, it would it would cost us more in premiums and uh, not knowing and not being able to be as expert as we can on this information. And not only is this for insurance and benefits, it's also HR. I can call, ask, give them a job description. I can call. We have never had an HR support besides something we would do through WASB or if we would call our lawyers and get paid per, and then get charged per hour. This also does allow us to make calls and they have human resource experts also. So Maria? Um, yes, as Aaron said, we started with Key Benefit Consulting and um, Linda's, Linda's company is very small and as she grew, she needed more consultants. So she um, had an agreement with the Horton Group and we were one of her people, one of her clients that pretty much got moved over to the Horton Group. So we're very familiar with, with the people there, very comfortable, um, very knowledgeable. They, their customer service is top notch. Um, and this is a list of, of all of the things that are included in our fee agreement, um, a lot more than, than what we had with key benefits. So we are, um, I've been having conversations with them today, as a matter of fact, they work with our members on individual health insurance issues that they might have. They work with us as a group. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're awesome to work with. And she, uh, Rayanne, is a very strong negotiator. Yeah. As we went through to get our negotiator with United Healthcare from 39 to 8.6 or 8.8, 8. 8. there's definitely some things that she can bring to the table. And then Alex, who is also um, more on the uh, benefits or on the uh, legal legal, legal side, how do you, what's it, yeah, compliance, what does Obamacare look like, what do we have to offer, they offer great advice. I, I've been very, very impressed. We still will retain Linda Mott, but only for what her specialty is, and that is for our OPEP analysis, and we, by state statute, have to do that every three years. Yes. Three years, so she'll still be doing that, and uh, she's still a good friend of the district. I was very impressed and happy with how, when she knew she couldn't meet our needs, she right, reached out to Horton Group, worked with them, and now understands totally this is the way to go. And I, 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 I'm very impressed with her. It's been a very seamless transition. And as Marie said, we have more now than we ever have. Any questions? Any other board members? All right, so it's the pleasure of the board. I entertain a motion that we uh, consider the contract with Horton Group. I'll second that. Uh, moving seconded to consider the, uh, uh, to accept the recommendation to move to Horton Group with the contract. And any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. Oh, that's key. Yes. Hi. Yes. Will. Yes. Motion carries. Item number three, discussion of the 2017 WASB resolutions in preparation for the Wednesday, January 17th delegate assembly. All right, an exciting time. Did Pass it over to Steve. And remember, these are ideas that WASB have. They act. They don't have anything except for ideas. Uh, but it does set the plank or the platform. There are different planks in the platform that WASB then does and we'll use SAA to lobby to try to help with in implementing and impacting um, statutes, funding, everything that's public school. Turn it over to Mr. Hawk. All right, and that was the keyword. It's lobbying policy, is what, the, the, what this sets up for the WSB staff when they go in and knock on the doors at the Capitol and have their meetings and stuff like that. So 
Um, let me just do, um, go through, uh, first of all, the, the first two are technical resolutions, which are just correcting some things, repealing, uh, replacing, re removing, amending, all based on uh, law changes that have come about with uh, the Act 35, the latest one that changed uh, several other things. So it made the existing policy um, sort of think of that. Uh, not needed anymore or not relevant anymore. So um, those, in my mind, those are just no-brainers to clean up the, the manual. So that goes all the way through to page three. And then um, resolution 1703 is the commencement of the school term. It's a variation of a, of a resolution we have now to try to um, bring back the start school start date before September 1st, or at least you know, to allow districts to decide when they want to start school. Um, this is kind of the chip away at that by allowing, the proposing to allow um, pre-K to eight school districts, which is a handful of them in the district, to be able to be exempt from that so that they can start earlier. Um, I'm not so sure about the rationale that you know, the, the September 1st date is from the tourism lobby, and that's what pushed it to begin with, um, saying they needed workers in the you know, past Labor Day weekend, or through Labor Day weekend, to be able to um, function, and they're saying that, you know, kindergartners and second graders aren't working in the Dells, you know, at the water parks, which is true, but I think what they're missing is, um, in addition to if you're going to have workers there, you're going to have families coming, and those kids go with their families, so uh, I think it's... I'll make a prediction that the governor's budget or somewhere in this, that that's going to be addressed. I, I think there's enough for people that's nowadays it's, I just think there's some movement. I think there's some goodwill that's fine. I don't know how many people are going to take advantage of. I see a lot of people right now, a lot of districts, they would always get turned down when they go for their exceptions. Like if we just said we want to do it and the board passed it, they'd say no way to the DCAB. But a lot of them are doing it now because of building. Like we're going to start the second or third week in August so we can get out third week in May so we can start building sooner because of capital improvements. So I see, I think you're 100% right, Steve. This is just a chip away. We'll try it at a different level. And I think within the next four years, three, four years, it's not going to really, next two biennial budgets, I don't think it's going to be an issue. That's what I'm here. I think some of the, the characters that are in the tourism industry lobby have moved on or they're not as strong as they were in the past, especially I think um, when Governor Thompson was here, there was one of his buddies who was big on that. So, um, okay, so I don't know what you think on that. I, to me, I, you know, it doesn't really affect us. It's, it's the K districts, like the ones around Hartford and down in um, Kenosha County, there's a bunch of them down there. Um, so, so even with that, like their, their own districts, that, I mean, does that affect us even? They're only K-8, so it's your whole district's K-8. Yeah. They feed into a, a union high like school Aaron, district. Like Aaron School District down by Aaron Hills where the U.S. Open is going to be a feed in Hartford. It's just K-2-8. Mm -hmm. Then if you, there's another one, maybe Arbavita or uh, Manaqua up, up north, they feed into Lake. And you know, another thing, too, the kids that are in K-8 likely or may likely have a high school student that would have to start after September 1st, so you know, it wouldn't really help them anyway, so that family. All right, um, 17.4 is increasing resources for summer school. Um, as you know, we get 40% FTE for students at summer school. This is proposing to move it to 100%, just like during the school year. The only question here is where's the money come from? Because it'll be an increased cost. So, but there's a big push of this because of Milwaukee and the resources that kids can have in the summer. Um, and and that, this is something that is really believed that having that resources and the money can help out. So this is one of the, Dr. Evers' big push. He really believes in this and this is a lot of big for this. Yeah. All right, 17.5, um, I had asked Aaron to kind of explain that because yeah. I didn't come across that. What this is, is that you might have heard of the Kenny Vento or Vento Act, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the 
the No Child Left Behind reauthorization. You've probably heard now there's foster kids and how we have to deal with that. What this says is it says, hey, thank you federal government for telling us what we need to do and how we have to spend money to handle these different groups of students. Now would you give us the resources to help? That's what this says. It's pretty much saying if you're going to ask us to do and deal with students that are mobile um, and it's a federal mandate, you can't not do it. Could you give us some resources to help? That's what this is. Mainly focused on transportation. Yep. Yep. What do you think? Is that something that benefits school districts or benefits us? Yeah. Anytime when you want more money, it should well, yeah, be. And it's kids. I mean, the thing is, is if you got a homeless kid, they didn't choose to be like, hey, I don't want to have a home, but then it's how do they get there if they're homeless or probably transportationless. And I think in our community, we do have some homeless students, and we've rented cabs, and we've actually, we've got staff that picks one up. So we've got an arrangement that we've got something signed that one of our staff members uh, helped bring a kid to school. And they're not homeless, but they have, they're very well could, you know, depending on what paychecks and jobs are. So, yeah, it's good for kids. It's one of those things where, hey, if you're mandating it, at least give us some relief federally and help. It, well, it also speaks to mobile students, and I think we've had some of that where they move around between districts because you know, people get upset and they move out and they move someplace else. And you know, this would allow the students to stay in the district of Oregon too, I believe, and then help with the transportation costs. And, and also, it mentions in there a little more too about when you have that mobility. For us, it doesn't really impact us all that much, but some districts. You're staffing, and then all of a sudden students are gone, and now what do you do with the staff if there's no longer students that need that? So there's a lot of worst case scenarios that are, are thought about in these, but I don't they, I don't think they're going to have that big of an impact. Once again, it's a federal program, so that would mean federal action would have to be made in order for something to be done. In 1772, I didn't mention that to you, but that's one I wasn't quite sure what it's getting at with narrowing disparities in allowable revenue under the revenue. That, that, that is, um, so let's say back in 1994, when revenue, revenue limits came into place, the school district A levied $10,000, school B levied $8,000 per student. Every year it's been a single amount or a percentage, like a 200 or 150 per kid or a what percentage. And what this would do, so what we've seen is, is that the, student, the schools that were levying more actually are growing and that disparity is getting bigger and bigger. So if let's say the level of uh, spending right now is average of $10,000 and we have schools that are spending at eight, can they be given the opportunity to level? It's not going to cost us the state anything. It's just those districts then without going to referendum can levy that money locally. So what it is is to help. This is something that's came up many times during the Doyle administration. It had, this had ha happened where some schools could do that. It's just recently uh, with the Republican and more conservative agenda, they've done everything possible to keep those property tax lines boom. So but what this would do is allow locals to say, hey, those that are low spending, if you want, if it's the, the board has to approve it, you can raise more than somebody who is already at that level. So that's what this would allow to do. And I don't know in the current environment if that's something the Senate and the Republicans, or I know that Governor Walker is big on no increase of in property taxes. So, but that this would allow locals to ask their consumers, "Hey, we're spending less than the average state." And this uh, this would probably be a lot of um, uh, more larger districts too. You'd be surprised. Larger districts act actually spend less per pupil in some senses than smaller ones because the smaller ones you don't have the economy of size. So you're looking at how much like the Oakfield spends per student is more than what we do um, because it, they just you, you know you don't you can't have less people in order to do certain things. So. But that's what that is, to allow that to happen. And that did happen pre-Governor uh, Walker. We've seen those adjustments. They haven't happened since. The change in our legislature and our leadership into more conservative. So that's something the school board? Could do, but we can't right now. But no, but I'm just saying, so it doesn't have to be voted on by the just people. Right, it wouldn't be a referendum. So for instance, if we had a revenue limit that, let's say, all like this year, I think it's going to be 150 $200. Now of that $150, $200, we get about 70% from the state, so that means we have $30. So that means we could increase our money $30 per kid, which would be X amount of money divided by however that is, okay? If you're in a district that is below state average, they might be able to raise their $70 instead of 30. So that then they can get closer to that. 
which would be local, but once again, that protection, it, it just hasn't been one of those things. It's trying to get people closer to normal. Okay. Uh, 178 is impact aid. Um, and, and federal money, again, and, and this thing deals with working with the National School Board Association to get Congress to get back to, and I, I wasn't aware of this, but from 1950 to 1969, they fully funded impact aid. And aid for districts that have federal lands and that are taxed, don't pay property tax, like Indian reservations and things like that. Or a, a national railroad, an international railroad, if you will. Okay. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. do you guys know that we don't get any money from from Canadian National? Oh, that's okay. And they don't pay property tax. So it would be, we are impacted by that. So I would think that'd be a good thing then for us to but in other words, and in that since '69, it's fallen as the amount they're funding. So it, you know, districts are losing out. Districts that have full reservations in them are earning much more than others. So, All right, 17.9. Educational goals and objectives. Some new language. I, I don't know what they're getting in here. I guess to try to, uh, to define well-rounded education. It, it, apparently there's a feeling that the you know, child left behind focus more just on math and language arts, and this is an effort with the new act that took its place, you know, again, if I understand it correctly, to uh, with testing, standardized testing, and things to look at all areas that go into providing an education for students, fine arts and um, health, physical education, music, all those things. So. Yeah, it's, I think it goes hand in hand with 1710. Because ESSA allows, there's four things right now. We have achievement, we have growth, we have narrowing gaps between different subgroups, and then we have college, or graduation, if you will, college readiness. We, there's a fifth one now, that by ESSA authorization, we get to pick. Our district is fully embraced in the redefining ready. Um, and I have, we have Kim Rowan's going to be having two more days or 12 more hours a week now for a while. It's really going to be working on that. And I think when you, the next one, Steve, this whole idea that kids are more than just a reading and a math score, let's start to measure other things so that we can see the importance that we get there. Then I think it works right in the 710, 1710. Okay. And those are both positive mm -hmm. words. Okay. 1711. Some of the early years, there used to be like nine or ten of these, and now they just seem to get more and more every year. But that's okay. We just missed lunch, I guess. Yeah. Um, 1711, Medicaid direct certification. The, the Very, this is something that would save a lot in Debbie's life and a lot of our other um, uh, people that deal with any health care reimbursement service, be it if it's a student that needs to be diapered or a student that receives Medicaid for any reason. Right now, just to give you a correlation, uh, lunch, free and reduced. There's some districts that go with direct certification, which means there doesn't have to be the applications, it's just one direct certification. Right now, Debbie and the team have to log hours, do all these things, and it is very, uh, a lot of work to do that. So this would just streamline that process. Okay, that's part of it. Okay, mental health support, 1712. Like, just a language change, basically, right? Currently says teachers, and they are proposing to change the language to all staff. One thing on this, just a uh, kind of a foreshadow, I think in the governor's budget we might see another Fund 80 um, exception, and that is for mental health. So right now Fund 80 is things that serve the community. And mental health, so if you have a social worker or somebody in the school district that costs that we normally couldn't afford, and we pay for that with Fund 80 money, that then would allow us to impact the, district, the community in many different ways because helping a kid and a family in school doesn't just do something here, it also helps and impacts police involvement, uh, social service involvement, uh, a whole bunch of different things. So there's going to be some action with, I believe in that, on helping to get funds because that's, that's really how it's going to be impacted. All right, 1713 and sparsity aid, which sparsity aid is um, more prevalent up in the north where there's districts with a lot of square miles but less students so they're getting less less money so uh, 
a number of them um, get uh, sparsity aid, an extra aid. And what this is asking is that if they, apparently there must be some talk about increasing the number of districts that would become eligible for sparsity aid, but it's, it's then don't, you've got to add the money then so that the districts that are currently in it don't have their aid less. Yep. So it's kind of a pretty basic thing. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, why should they hurt? Be heard because we add more people to the program, with more districts. Uh, 1714 is recovery school districts, um, and it's just a pretty strong statement to go along with what we've had about um, basically keeping strength in public schools and, and not continuing to provide more and more funding for private school, private school um, uh, vouchers, and things like that. That community needs to be involved with the development. So, okay. So it goes away from the no child left behind punitive, and how can we help instead of just punish? All right. Fifteen is uh, weapons possession. Um, that talks about allowing local school board to decide if we're going to allow would allow concealed carry. Basically, mm -hmm. so it focuses on um, instead of having. The state say everybody has to allow it to see. carry the, the district decide for themselves. There's local school boards. So. This isn't even an option, Wyoming. We got some friends. I got a friend out there, a superintendent out there. Oh yeah, the local police or sheriff is 40 minutes away, so they not only are okay with it, they recommend that staff does conceal carry if they have one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the world, though. I'm all. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then 16 is what I was starting to talk about before, mixing the two together, education savings accounts. And um, they want a strong statement that the school board association opposes the establishment of an education savings account because it's another way of taking public school money and providing it to parents um, to send their kids to private schools or virtual schools on it. Like that. And their argument is Nevada and Arizona are two states that are already going down this line. I think Los An I think the Las Vegas school district might already be looking at this. It, it pretty much is. It's if every company gets seven grand for their kid, you get that, it goes into a savings account. And then if you want to send North Fond Lac to Fond Lac to the Springs WLA, that's on you. Every every kid is worth X and then you get that one. Which isn't look at the different variables in kids kind of rips the shreds, the whole idea of public education and how it's funded. Can I just ask a question? So I, I'm curious with the weapons possession. So like our kids that are part of the track team? So we deal with that in our policies. And currently right now, if a gun, if there's a weapon that's a, like a shotgun, that's in a vehicle that doesn't have any ammunition and that is um, cased, that's okay. That's fine. But we, we do, but we tell our kids if you're in a trap or anything else, no, right. not bring it on school property right. at all. We have different. Or sometimes just innocent people. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And that's why we have it. And that's that's like when we see, like if some kid's got like a knife, there's many times a kid will have a knife and somebody sees the knife, it drops out of a locker, and then we'll say, hey, what's going on? They're like, well, I didn't really get home when I was hunting this weekend, and it's like, all right, well, next time you shouldn't, if you see it, bring it to the office first. So it's all, we, we have our, we have our, our policies are, are based on, I think they're, they're good, but we also really make a strong message that if you cannot bring a gun on grounds, which most, we don't, we're good at it. 
And I would highly recommend that we don't allow concealed carry. <laughs> Once again, if we talked about with the expulsion, because if we bring a weapon or if we bring drugs or if we bring alcohol or something, introducing a weapon, a loaded weapon into an environment just inherently is a danger. Unless you're trained and you are a police officer. Because we do have we do have guns in school, police officers have. There's a, an exception to the current law. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last one, 17, is gender identity. Um, mostly informational, I believe. Um, it's created a policy that advises boards and the administration to monitor the legal cases that are happening now and have been happening, assess whether our policy and practices or district policy and practices uh, are not denying equal opportunities based on gender identity. And I can tell you that the way we function is we see gender identity the same as any other discriminatory um, practice. If, if you're male, female, black, white, age, um, uh, sexual orientation, there's already laws that um, protect from discrimination. And the mindset of the district so far has been, and also from legal representation and also with nationals that this is already something that's protected underneath discrimination. And we do have students that have gender um, identity that are looking at transitioning, and we deal with those families individually, and every kid's different. You'd be surprised at how the kid is so much different than the parent, and how the kid wants something different than what the parent wants. And I can tell you just currently right now, we're dealing with this, a situation, was is it working out perfect for everybody? No. But is it working out? You bet it is. And uh, so currently what we do is, we don't have any extra policies because we feel the discrimination law and our policies looking at discrimination already cover this. And then whenever there's any situation, we look at that. One thing though that we did talk about is we look at remodeling the building, I was talking with Jenny Harney, is that we are probably gonna build separate changing rooms and locker rooms. So if you have a boys or a girls locker rooms, there would maybe be two rooms where there's a shower, and, and uh, but you can shut the door and change there because it'll just, I think in time, gender's not going to matter all that much in five, ten years from now, as far as disseminating and separating. But that's where that's going to, is let the locals decide and let's be a little bit more level-headed. Right, and then just, the, it's not taking in a position or anything, right? It's just saying, stay on top of it, be yep. aware of what's happening, because of, especially because of the court cases. Yep. And there's competing federal circuit court. Actually, the U.S. Supreme Court took a, a gender identity case, a school gender identity case, so we're going to find out what they say, which is cool, because then we'll do what they tell us. Yeah. We good. All right. Well, let's send them here if you want to review it again further before the convention. Do you have any thoughts on any of them? How we should vote? Coffee clutch with Steve. There you go. That's all I have. All right. Thanks, Steve. Sir. Sure. All right. Well. Brings us to the end of the published agenda, and item L is an adjournment. Before we go, I just wish everybody a happy holidays. Um, Merry thanks. Christmas. Yep. Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever we've got going, and happy New Year's. And thanks for all the support that the board has given the district this year, also administrative team. Uh, thanks for all that you guys have done. Mary, you are the number one attender of school board <laughs> meetings, I think, in the last decade. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. She's the oldest. Thank you guys very much. I like the number one cousin a lot better. I hear a motion to adjourn. <laughs> hey guys, at the meeting tomorrow, fine. I didn't plan. I thought we were is that good. I said that we'll just wait to do it on the tenth, like the white elephant. Not tomorrow. I don't know. Is that cool? Yeah, we're cool. All right, because I I don't think we prepared that.